Okay, good afternoon. Uh, so last time I talked about cross-validation uh, and also about overall model checking. And then uh, last time in the second half of the lecture, there was the basic idea of the cross-validation, why it is useful and also in a way that the there are different types of cross-validation depending on what is the structure of the data and what is the modeling task and so on. Um, today, I will continue where we left last time. First, about uh, computational issues, how we can do this in reasonable time, and then uh, model comparison, model selection, um, some warnings, relations to other approaches, and then uh, I will also, during the second half, uh, discuss the topics which go beyond um, the cross-validation, and also in the end I will also discuss more about this project work presentation. Um, so, last time I started with this leave out cross-validation in a way that if we want to know how good our model would be predicting future, but we don't have that future data yet, we use all other observations but one to fit our model, we can make predictions and then check how that left out observation uh, performed. I did discuss also other alternatives in, in that structure that we can leave also more observations at the uh, same time. But it's quite often then that this leave on out is sensible and also why it is commonly used is it turns out that we can compute it very fast. The naive implementation would require that if we have n observations that we would need to also then do model fitting n times, each time when we leave one observation out. But now uh, we can use this pareto smoothed important sampling, leave one out gross validation, uh, quite a long name, um, to make very fast computation given just draws from the full data poster. K-fold cross validation is another way how we can do and which is also often actually needed when we have more structure in the data and we want to uh, leave more observation at the same time. So this was the, the simplest data example I had um, last time. So just uh, some values x and for each value x we've observed some y we assume that there's some relationship between these, but also in a way that if we would given the same x, observe y again, there can be variation. And we can fit the model, and we can also, now that when we are running um, Marco Chen Monte Carlo, we can get posterior draws, we can, for each posterior draw, we can plot a line, which could be possible a line explaining the data, and we can see now also the, kind of the uncertainty that where there are more lines, uh, these are the more likely values, and then some of the, and where there's less lines, it's less and less likely that uh, that kind of lines would be uh, explaining this data. And, and this, this is easy now to do with stand, is kind of the, um, posterior draws. Uh, and then we can also compute now then this predictive density um, so that now this y tilde given x tilde and theta s in this specific example it would be Gaussian distribution and theta s would be then uh, the intercept and slope and the sigma for the Gaussian, and then from those we can compute the parameters given at a certain x value, 
and then we have just many Gaussians, and from each Gaussian we can compute the density, and then taking the empirical average over posterior draws, we get integ we integrate approximately out these thetas to get this posterior pre predictive density, which is the second term there, p y tilde given x tilde, and the observed data so far. And then we want to evaluate this given specific value. We have circled now the data. And then on the other hand, when we do the Levenout cross-validation, uh, we remove this observation. Now you learned important sampling earlier, and that's what we can now also do. So we can uh, we would like to get posterior draws from the posterior conditional on all the other x's and y's except that 18th observation which is circled. But we get only posterior draws from the full data posterior. So our full data posterior is our important sampling proposal distribution and this is our target distribution and ratio of those is our importance ratio. And we can see now that going back to full data posterior, I now uh, change the alpha channel, so how strong the color is based on these ratios. So you can see that the lines are exactly the same but they are closer to white if they have very small ratio. And so some of the lines disappear. You can't see them anymore because they have so small ratio. So they are downweighted. And then some of them are with the higher um, ratio, so stronger. And so you can see the effect that uh, Weighting these, we get now more lines which are um, not that much towards that specific observation. So full data posterior, importance, ratio weighted um, posterior. Now, this ratio happens to be such that you remember our model is in this case such that we have assume that each observation yi given xi and then the parameters theta s that these were Gaussians and conditionally on the parameters, we assume that y, conditionally on parameters and xi's, we assume that then these yi's are independent. So we have product of those, and then we have prior. And now if you think that, how does it then look like the posterior distribution for leave an out case. There's just one term less here. And it means now that when we have this ratio, the above, we have one likelihood term less, and below then we have one likelihood term more, and then it's proportional to this one per. There's some normalization term needed and that's why uh, we have just the proportional. But now it means that it's easy to compute this ratio because we are computing these um, likelihood values anyway. Um, as usual, it's good to uh, actually work in log scale. This is also what we already do in when writing stand code we work in uh, in increment the log density. And so we just have that this is minus log 
likelihood value for ith observation. And then using this importance uh, weights, we can then compute the importance weighted predictive distribution. And now, uh, if we previously did the, just the empirical average uh, over posterior draws, now we have the additional weighting term there, the WI. Now there's a notice I had first just raised those R, and now I have W. There's a reason we, we do something, small thing to these R's to turn them to these W's. But these W's now are the weights, and according to these weights, we can use these posterior draws, likelihood, the uh, predictive density values given those posterior draws, we just weight it with these. And since these weights are now normalized certain way, that's why we don't need that one per S in the beginning, what we had for the empirical average when computing the posterior predictive densities. So we do something which here we do this Pareto smoothed Pareto smoothing for these raw importance ratios to turn them to weights. This will help stabilize this this uh, importance sampling. So, so the in, in the importance sampling, uh, the importance ratios are the density for the target distribution divided by density for the proposal distribution. And I can, let's put them then here both. Now I can. So the difference now is that, so this is now the full uh, posterior. Of course, these are now again proportional. So these are without normalization terms. So this is what we would have, likelihood with all, all observations. So we would have here y going from 1 to n. And in a leave one out case, we would have I going from, and then we would have a set, actually I need now different letter J. J is everything from one to one minus I minus one, and then I plus one, and then to N. So here we are missing one of the likelihood terms. And here we have that likelihood term. So this term. So these cancel out. And these cancel out otherwise, but then when we are canceling out, because this had the one term more, we have here the, this one. Because this one has different normalization term than this one. And we don't know these normalization terms. As usual, when we are using MCMC, we don't know the normalization terms of these posterior distributions. So we are all the time working with unnormalized things. But it doesn't matter because the normalization term uh, is anyway constant with respect to theta. But if we are working within the same sampling uh, chain, yeah, because we are not sampling separately, so, wouldn't they be the same? Um, so the normalization term for this 
would be integral of this integrated over theta. A normalization term for this is this integrated over theta. But we have different terms, so they have different normalization terms, which we don't know. But they are anyway constant with respect to theta. And then we can drop those out, but we need to just remind that, OK, this is proportional. to. Uh, this is also now that um, sin, you remember that uh, hopefully from the, when we talked about importance sampling, that it is enough that we first get just these raw weights and we can do self-normalization. So in this case, we are also doing the self-normalization so that we compute the sum of all these ratios and divide these raw ratios with that. But in addition, we are doing also here the Pareto smoothing, which I uh, say something a bit soon. I did also talk about that when we had the important sampling, but I'll, I'll say again. So one thing with the, always with the important sampling is now that uh, it is possible sometimes that some of the weights are very large. And then if there would be one weight which would be much, much larger than any of the others, then when we do the self-normalization also, then that weight would dominate the sum. And when we would normalize, that one really, really big weight would have uh, then real, kind of the normalized weight close to one. And if all others are zero, it's kind of that we would have only one effective draw. Here also we can see that some of the weights are much larger than the others. The red dashed line is showing that what would be the case if we would have equal weights. So you can see that many of the portrait draws have now smaller weights than in the equal weighting, and some of them have much larger. The good thing is now that looking at this distribution of these weights, we can analyze how reliable this important sampling is. So here are 400 importance weights so that uh, you can see a bit more easily those small bars which are each individual importance weights and the largest one is almost um, 0 0.05. Good thing is that it's not close to one so we still have also other weights which are affecting the um, that integral approximation. Now this, this is uh, 4,000 importance weights. So now it's really difficult to see where the small bars are for individual weights. But based on the scale, you can uh, guess that then the largest weight is close to 0 0.02. Still, the largest weight is having less than one fiftieth of the mass, and so there are other also relatively big weights. So this is not really really bad. But we can quantify this a bit better. We are able to compute effective sample size, uh, which is in this case four hundred fifty nine. So we've lost a lot compared to having 4,000 draws. So we are always in important sampling. We are losing some information because some of the weights get really small and don't affect. And only the, the walls, those ones which have a bigger weight are affecting. The good thing is then that we can then get this effective sample size estimate um, from the weights. Uh, now I have to check. Oh, yeah. I missed, now, missed a, the equation for, for how to compute this effective sample size. Um, do you remember that I had that in important sampling lecture? Yes, I think so. Okay, good. But to remind you, uh, 
this is based on anyway in the idea that if we would have just one weight which would be have almost one and all the other ones would be almost zero, then it's clear that we would have effective sample size just one. If we would have all equal weights, that would be the other extreme end that then the effective sample size would be same as how many draws we have. And here we can see that there's a difference in the kind of the how variable these weights are. So the extreme case in variability is that one weight is one and others are zero. And the other end extreme is that all of them have same value. And then from this, we can get uh, the kind of the variance of weights idea, we can get then this uh, value uh, that we call then this effective sample size. The problem is that sometimes this important sampling can be also such that this variance is not actually finite. And then this variance-based effective sample size estimate is of course then um, bad underestimate because it's always um, finite value. There was then in this paper about the Pareto smoothed important sampling, there was two things. The both are based on that instead of just looking the variance of these weights, we look tail save of the largest weights. There's a theory which says that if we go far enough in tail of, um, so that this, this holds for many, many distributions, and we assume also then it holds here that if we look only the extreme tail of these weights, that extreme tail can be well approximated with generalized Pareto distribution. So the weight distribution here, for example, it's something that it has here, the kind of the bulk, and then it has a long tail. We try to find kind of automatically some point where we cut and we look only about this tail part. And then, based on this theory, we assume then that this uh, tail part can be well approximated with generalized Pareto distribution. It has two parameters. One of them is the kind of the scale parameter and another one is shape parameter. And this shape parameter K is good in that way that it is telling how many finite moments that weight distribution has. Um, if in a, and then now there's again a difference between what would happen in asymptotic case and in finite case. So if we know that asympt in asymptotic case, if we get infinite number of draws and then we estimate this tail shape, if that k is less than half, 0 0.5, then we know that variance is finite. If the variance is finite, then we know that central limit theorem holds, and then we can know that there's a fast convergence in accuracy when we get more draws. If the tail is very, very thick, so that the, this Pareto K estimate for kind of the, how, the, how thick the tail is, if it's larger than half, there's a reason then to suspect that there's uh, infinite variance, central limit theorem doesn't hold. There's a generalized central limit theorem which still holds, but uh, we start to see behavior that near half, we still get uh, relatively good convergence rates, uh, even with the, the based on this um, generalized central limit theorem, but then, if the 
tail gets thicker and thicker, closer to one, at some point, the convergent rate drops uh, to very low value, and then we would need huge amount of these draws to get this important sampling to be reliable anymore. We first found out empirically that it's around 0 0.7, this value, and now we have also in the latest version of that um, paper, which should actually now also include, so uh, should be Vehtari, Simpson, Gelman, Yao, and Capri, so Simpson and Yao also included. We have um, theoretical results also showing why around 0 0.7, the minimum required number of draws starts to grow that fast that it's impractical with the um, computing with computers. So one reason why then we um, have this Pareto name going there is that when we do this important sampling weighting to get this leave and out cross validation, one thing is to get, have this diagnostic but it also that we can actually then, when we fit the Pareto distribution to the tail, it means that we are actually also modeling this tail part. And using a model instead of just raw data reduces variability and we get more stable estimates. So we are using also Pareto to, uh, distribution to model the largest weights and to, that stabilizes these Pareto smoothed important sampling estimates. I'll go back here. So now we can repeat this for uh, n times. So we fit the model with all the data, all n observations. But then we can do n times this important sampling, which is very fast. It is very fast, n times to compute just these terms for all the posterior draws, make these raw ratios, make the Pareto fit to the largest weights, have the diagnostic value, and also the model the largest weights which is then this transformation that raw ratios, largest raw ratios are then uh, smoothed, filtered to get uh, more stable Ws, which are then used to uh, compute these um, predictive density estimates. We don't usually plot these weights, we just usually plot this effective sample size estimate and these, um, or, or print out the effective sample size estimate and this k hat value. We can also plot these diagnostics for each observation um, separately. So here there was 20 observations and we can check for each of them then what, would, what was this Pareto k estimate. You can see the, the red dashed lines there uh, the 0 0.5 being the kind of the around where the we get really fast convergence below that, and we get useful results up to Pareto k 0 0.7. And then loop packets gives this kind of printout, so it's reporting how many of these leave and out cross validations had good Pareto K value or OK, and also showing then these minimum effective sample size values as a diagnostic. Uh, there's, what I don't have a slide, but briefly mentioned that this Pareto K diagnostic is based on finite number of draws, and it kind of works also well as uh, pre-asymptotic diagnostic. There are cases where by construction we can know that the variance is actually finite, but even then we might see 
in finite case, Pareto K estimates which are larger than half. And then this can be explained that um, with the some cases with finite data, it's just that it's possible that with finite data we are not able to see difference between the infinite variance or finite variance case. And anyway, at that point when we have the finite number of draws, we just know that we would need very, very large number of draws uh, before we could also know whether the variance is actually finite. We just know that it's, it's going to be anyway really big. Question was, does negative k-value have a special meaning? Uh, so Pareto, generalized Pareto distribution which has negative k has um, tail which has um, finite support. So there's some largest value there. The case where we would have uh, that is uh, if we have um, bounded ratios. And th this is actually quite common that we can have that kind of constructions that we would have bounded ratios exactly. And, uh, and then when we eventually could learn where, um, what are the largest ratio possible, we would then also uh, learn um, that the k is below zero. It's just that again, there are many cases where it can be bounded, but it's just uh, really difficult to actually observe that bound, and then the Pareto k is again, it's this diagnostic is describing the behavior in this pre-asymptotic case, and not what would happen if we would have infinite number of draws. It's the same with the, the effective sample size, uh, and it's then usual that, so if you look that here, the largest Pareto K was for the 18th, and then correspondingly the smallest effective sample size for, was for this 18th. So it's usual that uh, if we have some weights which are very large, so that made the effective sample size small, but then that makes also the tail uh, thickness such that the Pareto K is then usually large. And so last time I did explain how do we compute this ELPD, uh, or what was the meaning of ELPD Lu, if we would do uh, refits every time and describe what is PLO, and now it was these diagnostics. Um, the Pareto K diagnostics, minimum effective sample sizes, and based on then these, we can also compute what's the Monte Carlo error, standard error <coughs> for ELPD loop. And you can see that, like in this case, the error is very small compared to that we have much more uncertainty because we have only 20 observations that makes also it uncertain that how the future will look like. I did mention that, so instead of that we would look these, uh, compute these ratios, we are uh, like to compute them in as log ratios, and then in stand code we would then add it in generated quantities, this kind of computation. So log click i or ith observation, normal underscore LPDF, yi observation given new i and sigma. Uh, Arsten Arm and BRMS, they compute this log likelihoods, they actually compute them outside of stand code currently in R, but in a way that they, they, they make it by default um, 
so that then these loop packets can uh, automatically do this. Um, so now this parameter smoothed important sampling, leave an out, works well when removing something doesn't change the posterior too much. If it changes too much, we get the diagnostic saying that, okay, there's a problem. Um, last time I did talk that sometimes we might actually want to do cross-validation so that we remove more things. So there was an example was these growth curves for rats, and we might be then interested in, are we able to predict growth curve growth curve for a new rat given the, all the other rats and then we would like to remove all the observations from one of the rats which would be this kind of leave one group out. In those cases we are removing more observations and also if the, that group has group specific parameter we might in that case actually remove all the observations for that group specific parameter and then it gets very challenging. It's likely then that it is paradosmoothed important sampling or any important sampling fails, and then there are alternative approaches for that, but requiring a bit more computation and not that easy to automate. Um, here I talk that, okay, the, that we have this factorizing form, that we have something the likelihood is product of independent terms, so it is then easy to remove just one term. But we have also paper discussing that non-factorizable multivariate Gaussian models can be also uh, handled with this approach. Time series is a bit different. I did discuss last time that in time series we might want to actually do this, uh, that we leave all the future out that not let the future to make it easier to predict what's happening next. Um, here's an example of the Huron Lake uh, water level data. And then uh, AR4 model prediction, so fitted to that and then making predictions. And then we would like to actually then now, what if we took some part from the beginning and then predict what's happening next, add that uh, to the fits and predict what's next. Um, now we are removing a lot of observations, so it's likely then that this important sampling doesn't work right away. What we can do is also this important sampling in other direction that we first fit the model with certain amount of data in the beginning and then we are doing actually important sampling predictions. So fit with certain data, predict the next and then use important sampling update to include that uh, to update the posterior and then predict next. Include that also using important sampling to update the posterior and then predict next. And this is also something that is then likely to at some point fail. So this is so in the Pareto case. So we use first in the beginning certain amount of data anyway. You can see then that how this Pareto case, when we add more and more observations without running MC, MC start to eventually increase. So we can add more and more observations. And at some point Pareto K goes to peak and then we do MCMC MC again. You can see here two times the Pareto case drop back to small values and it means that only two times we needed to run MCMC MC, and still we were able to get that many kind of um, leave future out cross validation estimates. Okay, questions about the important sampling cross-validation? No? K-fold cross-validation is simpler. Um, 
we just, instead of in a, leaving just one out, one observation out, we leave block of data out. And it's still possible also approximate something which would be kind of dissimilar to leave an out. But it's also specifically useful if we have these hierarchical models and good for leave one group out or leave several groups out and also um, can be used for time series. The kind of the difference is that um, if we leave more observation out, we can do also kind of the different things. For example, if we want to have something which would be close to leave an out cross validation, we would leave observations out so that they are far away from each other. Because in leave and out, we were also having the observations nearby. And so here we would have also in a way that we are not removing nearby observations. And then we would just change which observations we are leaving out. If we randomly choose, then we might have, in this case, that we sometimes remove two nearby observations. And then it's difficult to predict either of those, which makes it a bit different more different compared to Lebanon. Um, if you think about this rat example where we had a growth curve for different rats, if we want to do something similar as Lebanon out, we could just randomly drop any observations without taking into account the structure. Or we could take into account the structure, leave one rat out, or leave several rats out, rats out and there are these functions which help with these different um, structures, uh, making these kind of index sets, what is left out and uh, what is used to make a model of it. Okay. Um, that paper um, practical cross-validation and blah, 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 has also WAKE in its name and also WAKE is in PDA3. So why I don't then teach WAKE anymore? Um, kind of the, at that point when we made the PDA3, it's, it was already big thing that we improvement this wake over DIC um, and it seemed quite good but there, there was a problem that it, it we knew that it is also sometimes failing and then I tried to figure out diagnostic for it that how do we know when it works well and then while doing that I figured out that it's actually easier to do the diagnostics for important sampling. And then that was the Pareto K diagnostic. Something similar can be used for wake, but it's just much more difficult. And then uh, also based on experiments, we saw that in difficult cases, Sislu works better. And in easy cases, even if some easy cases, wake might perform better but because they are easy cases, they are so close to each other that it's not meaningful difference um, which one is working better. It has same assumptions as Lee one out cross validation anyway. So in a way that uh, if you are using wake, you can also switch to Lee one out and it's kind of giving you the trying to estimate the same thing. And it's just that now Syslu is more accurate in difficult cases where it matters more, and it has the better diagnostics, which is important if something is likely to fail. I also think that then uh, in leave out cross-validation, we are emphasizing that uh, kind of thing that it is just one observation we try to predict given other data um, than that 
uh, observation we want to predict. And then it makes a connection to k-fold cross-validation um, more clear and in a way it's good to that think about what is the model structure, what is our modeling task. It's easier to also think about different utility and cost functions in, in case of cross-validation. There's also strange thing, people keep multiplying by minus two, so blue packets, BRMS are reporting also something called blue IC. I hate that, uh, but I can't get my collaborators to remove that uh, because there are so many scientific fields that are so used to information criterion that uh, at least we get them to use syslu if we call it flu IC, but then I get, I'm annoyed then that there's the multiplier by minus two. It had a historical reason, um, but otherwise it, it's, so it's not needed anymore. Uh, connection to other ones, so wake is really similar to what I was explaining with the, when we do Bayesian uh, predictions integrating over parameters, wake is kind of the same as this um, Levanot cross-validation, and then the differences are AIC, assuming maximum likelihood estimate for prediction, DIC, assuming posture mean for prediction, BIC is connected to base factor I mentioned soon, and then there's plenty of other ICs I don't go through, but in a way that they are, except for the BIC, they are also trying to estimate the predictive performance, and it's easier with um, leave one out cross validation. So the marginal likelihood and base factor, there's a bit of that also in PDA3, mentioning that why we don't recommend that in general. Um, one way to think about is that if you look at this marginal likelihood and use chain rule, it's like leave future out cross-validation, but starting with zero observations. So you can think that we first try to predict just the first observation just based on prior. And now you can think that then it means that this first prediction uh, part, it is sensitive to your prior. If you change your prior, that density will change a lot. Um, and then predicting the first, it, Often also possible that even if you have updated your posture with one observation, it's still difficult to predict the next and so on. It seems that the proponents of base factor um, are mainly thinking about models with only one or two parameters. And even then, they are also admitting that it is prior sensitive and you need to uh, look the result with different prior values. And it seems that people who don't recommend base factors are using much more complicated models with a lot of parameters where it is, the, it is, the base factor is much, much more sensitive to prior choices, even if the posterior predictive distribution or the posterior is not sensitive, posterior predictions are not sensitive, and cross-validation is not sensitive. There are some special cases, again, just these models where there's not much parameter, maybe just one parameter, that it can be useful to compute this base factor. But most of the time I, um, don't work that with that kind of models, and I assume also that you don't often work with that kind of models. Yeah. Uh, 
in addition that it's very sensitive to prior, base factor is also unstable in case of misspecified models, um, which is related to kind of this, the same thing. Um, and there are papers, papers on that. Uh, I don't go to details on this. And then it's also unstable asymptotically. So in, mis in case of misspecified models, even if you would get more and more data, it can still be behaving badly. Um, okay, let's have an um, eight-minute break, and I will then continue with the model comparison.